La Casas has retreated to the Dominican monastery, become, become a Dominican friar. And um, caused some more trouble with the Encompianderos. Uh, and but has gained notoriety by negotiating a peace with the Taino tribe and the Crown of Spain, which is a big, you know, big win. Okay. Uh, now, right about this time, as he's in the monastery, is when the final expulsion of Muslims occurs within the Kingdom of Spain. The Jews had been expelled back in 1492, right when Columbus made his first voyage, uh, but Muslims were tolerated to some extent up until 1526, and now pff, that's over. So. We have uh, a Spanish uh, government that is becoming more and more intolerant, right? Uh, the Jews were the first target, but ultimately Muslims become the target. And, and of course, throughout this time, the Spanish are colonizing more and more of Africa, again, where people are African, like black African, and, um, and are largely Muslim. Uh, if they're not part of some pagan tribe, the alternative to that is Islam. Um, and right about this uh, time period, we have Otahalpa uh, Sapa Inca. So Otahalpa is a person. He is Sapa Inca, the only Inca. He's the Incan emperor. And um, he was emperor of the realm of the four parts. And this was a legitimate, just like the Aztec Empire back in Mexico, which we're maybe a little more familiar with, um, with Montezuma and, and all that. Um, the Incan Empire was in modern day Peru was was legitimate, was serious, was a, a serious empire with civilization. Um, and um, Altahalpa uh, is captured in battle by Francisco Pizarro. Who, so Francisco Pizarro is one of these big, um, you know, um, conquistadors uh, like Cortez, Francisco Pizarro is right up there with Cortez uh, behind Christopher Columbus. And, um, and so Peru now becomes a colony of Spain. And so this is a, a, a grand, a large new territory of exploitation. And the silver and gold coming out of Peru is quite, quite, quite extraordinary, uh, very significant. <clears throat> right about the same time, we have the Society of Jesus. Uh, these are otherwise known as the Jesuits. Uh, they're forming in 1534. Um, the Jesuits are famous for being part of the Counter-Reformation. So the Reformation has already started by this point and really heating up now in the 1530s is when it's that very chaotic civil war, like more than civil war. It's like just county by county, like uh, so that a, a, a small geographic region could be fighting a war on multiple fronts against the next county over, um, just all across Europe. Um, very chaotic. The Society of Jesus forms uh, the Jesuits 
in this context and their leader, um, Leola, uh, had been a military captain um, and thought very militaristic, but it does seem that the original intention is to be like a peaceful army to really try to convert people back to the traditional ways of Christianity and get away from um, the craziness of this period. Uh, but they do come become deeply involved in the counter revolution or the counter reformation, which was a kind of revolution, Freudian slip. Um, and um, in the process of this, they do become known for their, their development of casuistry. I mean, when you speak of casuistry, it's really the Jesuits that you think of. And uh, it's an Aristotelian form of rhetoric. So it uses elements of Aristotelian philosophy that I've talked about previously. Um, but it's a pretense of critical thinking. It's not genuine philosophy. It's, it's more the technique of lawyers. Uh, the complaints that I had about Thomas Aquinas um, just get notched up to 11 um, with the casuistry of the Jesuits. So that they're not so interested in following the logic as it presents itself, but predetermining a result and then using every rhetorical means to try to prove the result that they've already decided upon. And, um, and, and, you know, and for, a full argumentation against, you know, why this is wrong. Um, take my philosophy 103 class. Okay, that's what philosophy 103 is about. Uh, critical thinking. This is this is not critical thinking. This is rhetoric, and and it's dressed up. It pretends to be critical thinking, and and that's that's the rhetorical aspect. It, it's a. Uh, it's a, a rhetoric that pretends to be critical thinking. Now, rhetoric like um, that we're familiar with, like uh, Donald Trump is very good at rhetoric, but he doesn't pretend to be talking rationally, right? He, he's not pretending to be rational. That's not his thing. But, but other people pretend that they're arguing strictly from logic but nonetheless, their whole argument is predetermined. And of course, this is the art of defense lawyers or prosecutions, you know, lawyers in general. This is, they, they ha the, the outcome is already determined, and then they just apply logic, but it's not really logic, to try to make their case. Um, that's casuistry. Um, and, and it has a, you know, it's, it's kind of per, a pejorative term. And when you say casuistry, you think Jesuits. Okay. Um, so they're known for this. Now, part of this is because they were a highly intellectual kind of um, holy order amongst the Roman Catholic priests. So they, they founded schools and universities that were devoted not only to theology, but also to the liberal arts. You know, they really believed in Aristotelianism and classical education. And so, you know, they're very much part of the Renaissance. They are a Renaissance order where most of the other orders are from earlier centuries, the medieval period, the Jesuits really come out of the Renaissance, so they are a Renaissance kind of order, uh, but they uh, fall in and out of favor, you know, and uh, they have a very, let's say, checkered reputation. <clears throat> uh, one thing they did is they kept meticulous records. 
Um, and uh, in particular, you know, they were very involved in the Latin American colonization and the records that they kept haven't even been delved to this day. There's just so much quantity of data uh, that needs to be explored and sorted out that uh, we don't even know what's there. But, um, but um, there have been uh, studies that inform a lot of the, the history, uh, you know, that I'm discussing. So, uh, but there's, there's way more there than, than uh, what we know about. So that's kind of like a, you know, a, a massive unknown just sitting out there uh, to see what exactly uh, is in these records. Uh, quite interesting. Because they're just so highly intellectual and had this different way of, of approaching uh, running an order of priests. Um, and, and, and what we'll find, okay, uh, with liberation theology, uh, the, the most popular founder is Gutierrez, who will read some of his chapters. Uh, um, and he's a Dominican, like La Casas, okay? Uh, but two of the other founders of liberation theology are Jesuits. Okay, so then Jesuits in the 20th century begin to be identified with liberation theology and even uh, maybe a more um, Marxism, uh, uh, Leninism brand of liberation theology, a little more revolutionary. Um, <clears throat> And even it's the, it's the Jesuits of liberation theology that coined the phrase, phrase option choice for the poor, that there's, a that there's a preference for the poor. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Jesuits are problematic, problematic. But uh, I think that comes out of, you know, from what I've described, about the Renaissance in, in, er, in earlier videos, um, you, you, you can see how that could be the case. Okay. <clears throat> and that, that's generally the case when it comes to philosophy or history. It's a mixed bag. You don't get good guys and bad guys. Um, you don't get people who are you don't get a long tradition of an organization that is not hypocritical. Uh, it's just, you know, um, some of it is good, some of it's bad. And there's internal conflicts within organizations and then there's a larger conflict going outside around it and it is it's very chaotic, especially as you stretch over centuries and centuries. Um, so you can't, you can't have a simplistic view of these things. <clears throat> okay, so in 1534, La Casa sets out for Peru, newly founded by Francisco Pizarro. Um, and he only makes it as far as Panama. Okay, then there's bad weather and um, Peru is pretty crazy. This is like the heart of darkness. Uh, there's, it's crazy out there. Um, but, uh, but evidently bad weather. Okay, so um, they retreat back to Nicaragua. La Casas spends some time there disputing with the governor about uh, his um, uh, participation in slavery and giving him a hard time. 
you know, and, and La Casa always has this ability to to assert himself uh, into into these high levels of government. Um, so there's there's just something about his character, and of course, you know, I mean, he has a certain amount of wealth um, from uh, being one of the early colonists. Um, uh, and, he, and he uses that to his benefit throughout. Um, again, he has failures, but he has wins, and he just consistently uses every last ounce of his uh, political currency to get in front of political leaders and give them a hard time. <clears throat> he soon ends up in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, he debates with Franciscan friars. Now the Francis Franciscans employed mass, uh, often forced baptisms. So they would convert the indigenous people in mass ceremonies of thousands of people, sometimes at gunpoint. Um, and Lacasas argued against this. He said that, you know, and he began to develop. Now this is, this is something where he begins to develop this whole um, philosophy about the indigenous people, that they're fully rational, that they're equal to Europeans uh, in rationality, and that conversion to Christianity, if it's involuntary, is not a legitimate conversion. And, and so he starts to draw very distinct lines, and, and he, he's not going to go along with this pretense of converting people when it's really just um, power plays. So this is kind of a, a turn, uh, maybe the second turn, you know, there was that conversion at, when he read that passage out of Ecclesiasticus, and here is, is another turn. And it's like, he sees now the Franciscans as a major enemy, a major impediment. And this is maybe what has been in the background and, and causing him so much trouble, you know, with the Kumana expedition and everything, is that there's a large force. The Franciscans were a large order within the Roman Catholic Church and doing a lot of missionary work out in the Americas. And they're just pretending to convert people. And Lacasas is arguing for genuine, rational, voluntary uh, conversion, genuine, authentic conversion. And the Franciscans are like, come on, we just need to get the numbers. Uh, it seems obvious from, uh, from our perspective that Lacasas is on the right side of this, but uh, at the time, Lacasas was by far in the minority. Um, so then he goes to Guatemala, you know, uh, next to Mexico, and he he goes on a mission. He learns the indigenous language, and he goes on a mission into the, the depths of the Mayan culture, which had not been colonized because they had so effectively fought off Cortez and other conquistadors, so that they had a region where they were, uh, were largely unmolested by the Spanish. Um, and he ventured in there with, with other uh, Dominican friars, um, having learned the language ahead of time and um, uh, was, was fairly effective. Now, before he did this mission, he used, again, his political power that he had somehow uh, and gained assurances from the governor of the area, that if the mission was successful, that no encomienderas uh, would be established within this, uh, you know, barbarian territory. 
and uh, he was successful. And then this land, formerly known as the land of war, became known as Verapaz, the land of peace. Uh, because it was so successful. And, you know, one of his kind of ingenious um, methods was to teach uh, Spanish campesinos, Spanish peasant colonists, songs in the language of the indigenous people that are, were religious in character and sort of produced this, this culture of, of song that infected um, the indigenous people with, with Christian ideology. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, uh, he really was uh, thinking in a quite sophisticated way, which I think we can be we can be critical of, uh, but we still have to admire his uh, ingenuity. Okay. Uh, then he spends some time in Mexico, and then uh, ends up, uh, and then uh, goes back to Spain, and um, and uh, is quite effective in Spain uh, at this turn of events. So I, I think I'm going to stop this video for now and then create a new video just to break things up a bit. <clears throat>